الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اجتبى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما باطلا ذلك ظن الذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من النار أم نجعل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كالمفسدين في الأرض أم نجعل المتقين كالفجار كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليذكر أولو الألباب صدق الله العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in these ayahs of the Quran al-Kareem reminding us of a very important fact that many times we forget whereas that is a reality and it's an important fact for us to remember and that is the purpose of the creation of this universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا This heaven and the earth and whatever is in between them, we have not created them for no reason. There is a purpose and a reason for creating all of this. ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا this is the thought of those who disbelieve in me. Those who do not believe in me, this is what they think that all of this is created for no reason. No reason means just for us to make our living. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in different way in another ayah of Quran al-Kareem, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنَعَامِ those people are like animals, in fact worse. What does it mean? Is it cursing? Of course not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not cursing. He's mentioning a reality. Sometime when we may look at this ayah of Quran al-Kareem, it seems that, okay, it's difficult to tell people that this is what Quran says, that people are living like animals. And it seems like, oh, it's a curse. It's not a curse. It's a reality. And when you compare the lives, you will see that exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is true. That people are living just like animals. The purpose of their life is nothing better than the purpose of animals' life. Day and night just worried about themselves, about their food, about their rest and that's it. The day comes in and out. And every day, that's the purpose of the life. This is what we are living for. We were recently in a journey talking to a person sitting next to me who was a president of one of the companies. So as we started talking, I asked him, what do you expect? What would you do next now? You became the president of the company. Now, what's next for you? The person is thinking, he says, you know, I'm trying to, every year trying to have the sale of this company better than the year before. I said, okay, now the company started making more this year. So this makes you happy now. This is everything you want to get out of your life. And next year, the company will make even more than that. So you will be happier. And the year after that, it will make even more. And it makes you happier than that. And finally, a year will come when you will have to think, now I will be retiring this year. What will happen after that? There is no goal of a life. 
There is no purpose of life. The only goal, the only purpose is let's just do something where we can earn more. We can make more. That's all. This is the whole life. I mean, if you start thinking about it, finally a person comes to a level where he doesn't know what to do next because I did this, I did this, and I got to this level now. Can I go beyond this? No. My expenses are always increasing. What should I do now? And this is when people start getting depressed. I was looking in one of the magazines and really I was surprised that depression is more in those who are very well to do comparing to those who are struggling for their lives, for their living. There is more depression in the upper level people, people who are making more. Because finally now what to do next? Now the person as he became the president of the company, he became the manager, he would like to become the owner. Now he looks at the owner, but he cannot become the owner of the company. So what will happen now? I got to the level that I'm just next to the owner. So I would like to become the owner now. Look how much this owner is making. See what he drives, see what, where he lives, see what he buys. I can do all of these things. And I'm just now, there is only one level of difference between me and him. The person is depressed, is struggling, and doesn't know what to do with his life anymore. There is another, now the owner, he is not satisfied either. He is looking at someone who is making better than him. And now he cannot have that company that belongs to someone else. And his company does not make as much as the other company makes. And everyone is looking at someone who is above him. And no one is satisfied. And the wealthiest person in the world, wealthiest person in the world, if he was asked to feed all the creatures in the world, for only one day he would fail. If he is asked to feed all the people for just one day, he will fail. Wallahu al ghaniyyu wa antum al fuqara. Allah is independent. You are always in need. You are always need. We always need more. And regardless of how much we have, our limitations are there. Subhanallah. Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is feeding the whole universe, the whole world, every day. And nothing is reducing from His kingdom. As it has been written in the tafsir about Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam. And I'm sure we all know the kingdom of Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam. The one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with such a kingdom that he was ruling even the air. He's ruling the jinns, he's ruling animals, he's even ruling the air. And he orders the air which direction to go and what to carry. Here, I need this thing to go over there. I need you, I need the air, he orders the air, I need you to take this and put it into that country. And the air will just take it. Take my whole army, including all the animals and jinns and human beings, they all are flying in the air. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him such a kingdom. Subhanallah, when you look at the ayahs of the Quran al of Surah al naml when he asked his people sitting around him, that who can bring me the castle of Bilqis? from her country and one of the jinns sitting next to him says I can bring the whole castle the way it is and the castle had 360 windows on each side of it because they used to worship sun 365 windows on each side of the castle 
Because each day, as the sun rises, it rises from a little different point than the point of the day before. So they made the windows such, they designed the castle such, that each day when the sun will be rising, it will be in front of one of those windows. Exactly, she can look out of the window and the sun is rising and she can offer her worship. And then the sun is setting from the other side and will be setting just in front of one of those windows. Exactly, she can stand at that window. Day by day, she is changing the window. And she would offer her worship from there. With that type of castle, I can bring I can bring the whole castle to you before you even get up. If you are sitting right now, you are sitting down. If you stand up, before you can stand straight, the castle will be next to you. So another person sitting there, he says, that's too late. You're taking too much. And he says, I can bring that castle to you before you can blink your eyes. At the blink of your eyes, you will see the castle here next to you. And he did it. Well, and he speaks of it. For some people, this is everything in the world. If I can get that power, then I have everything. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given those powers to whomever he wanted. He gave it to Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, such a kingdom, such a power that no one in the world will ever have it again. And Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam used to say, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also quotes about him, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me all of this to see if I would be thankful servant of his or I would just go away after getting whatever he has given me. This is all a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, without going into those details of his kingdom, Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam, once he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow him to feed all the creatures of the world. It's such a kingdom. A person who has the power and he's ruling the animals, so he can get as many animals he wants from the jungle. And he has no limitations there. Go to the jungle, get whatever you want. Go to the oceans, get as much as you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Sulaiman, you cannot do that. Ya Allah, let me try for once. Just once in my life. And of course, with that type of kingdom, you would like to do something unique. And after preparing for a whole <coughs> month, he was ready now. The day came when it was his turn to start feeding the creature. Ya Allah, where should I start from? Start from the ocean. Go by the seashore, put the meal over there, and invite the fish to come and eat. He goes over there, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عُلِّمْنَا مُنْطِقَ الطَّيْرِ وَوْتِينَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He used to speak the language of the birds and the animals. He calls upon them. Quran speaks about him hearing an ant speaking to another one in Surah Al-Naml. So, he goes and calls over there. A big fish comes, a well, whatever we may call it, something we may not even have seen. And all the preparation that was over there, it comes, swallows up everything in one mouthful. Says Suleiman, where is the rest of my food? Suleiman alayhi salam just looked at it, subhanAllah. The thing that I prepared for the whole universe, for all the creatures, this is one animal here that comes and takes everything and asking me for the rest of the food? Suleiman, Am I going to stay hungry today? And Sulaiman turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, you are the razzaq. Ya Allah, you are the razzaq. I can never become the razzaq for the people. Not even for one day. I cannot even prepare for them, forget about creating it for them. Allah is razzaq, He creates it. I cannot even prepare what you have created. For, for all the creatures. 
kind of our limitations are there. Human beings are human beings. So if this, if this was the purpose of the life, every human being will be depressed. We can't do nothing. Every time you look at something, that's it. That's the end of it. We can't do anything any better than that. So there is a purpose of this life. And the purpose of this life is, we should be connecting our soul to the one who has power over all of these things. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ The one who has power over everything. The one who does not have the word impossible in his dictionary. The one who has no limits, no boundaries. Nothing limits him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once the person gets into that type of kingdom, where there are no limits, where there is nothing impossible, and then he gives us the instructions and the guidelines. This is how you're supposed to do it. Subhanallah, what else I need? I'm doing it only for him. And for him there is nothing impossible. For him there are no limits. And I will keep on doing it for him. I'll do as much as I can. And the rest is on his hand, hand in, his, in his control. He will do it the way he would like to do it. No more depressions. No alayhi salatu wassalam inviting people for 950 years. Imagine... What Quran says about him, Rabbi inni da'autu qawmi laylan wa nahara, falam yazidhum du'ai illa firara, wa inni kullama da'autuhum litakhfira lahum ja'alu wa sabi'ahum fi adhanihim, wa istakshaw thiyabahum, wa asarru, wa istakbaru istikbara, thumma inni da'autuhum jihara, thumma inni alamtu lahum wa asaratu lahum israra. He's mentioning all different ways and forms of inviting people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, I went and talked to them publicly. I went and announced it to them. I told them secretly. I took them in small groups. I took them at night. I talked to them daytime. I talked to them in every way possible. Try to explain to each and every person. Try to explain to them in groups. But they don't want to listen, Ya Allah. For how many years? 950 years. Is he depressed? What medicine was he taking? For us, next day we'll be taking some tablets. That's it. Nothing is working for us. We gave up all the hopes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the battle of Ahad. We all know when the situation changed. <coughs> and I would never call it when they were defeated. Just the situation changed for time being. And then again, they got control over that situation. During that period... When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's tooth was broken, he was wounded. He's sitting in a cave on the mountain of Ahad. And he's cleaning the blood of his face and makes the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, these are the people who have done this to their Prophet. Ya Allah, treat them equally. Punish them for what they have done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Oh Muhammad, don't say nothing about the situation. It's not in your control. And it's not your call to do what I want to do with these people. Don't make a dua against these people. Although they have done this to you, don't make a dua against these people. You have no control over the situation. You keep on trying, and it's for me to decide what I would like to do with these people. If I would like to punish them, I will punish them. But if I would like to guide them, I will guide them. If I don't want to punish them in this world or guide them, that's my call too. And here, how fast we start making dua. <coughs> making dua against everyone. Ya Allah, destroy this nation and destroy that nation. Make dua of the hidayah. Because the first question will come to me and you. And that is, if you made that dua of destruction, what did you do for them? Did you tell them that this is the deen of Allah and they didn't, they didn't listen and then you went and made, the, made a dua against them? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the da'wah to the, these people of Mecca for 13 years in Mecca Mukarramah. Then even after coming to Medina, still he's making da'wah. And then when the situation comes when he's injured, and he's making dua against them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, no, you have no right to do this. Don't do this. Imagine, 
if we make a dua, and now in Salat al-Zuhr I would like to make dua, Ya Allah destroy this nation. By Salat al-Asr they should be done now, Salat al-Asr I will make dua for another nation, Ya Allah destroy the other nation too. And Salat al-Maghrib I'll make a dua for third nation. And then I will be asking Allah, Ya Allah, I told you in Zuhr to destroy that nation, how come they are still living? SubhanAllah, this is our situation with our deen, with our responsibilities of conveying the message, of preaching the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then this is how we are dealing with Allah, as we are going to tell Allah what to do. If Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once in Quran al kareem that there you have no control over the situation and you should not be doing this what you are doing that is making dua against them and he tells them in a situation he tells him that in a situation that is bleeding and is injured and if he is telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this at that situation at that time and is telling him once in Quran he can tell us that he can tell us the same thing a million times who are you people to tell me this who are you people to suggest to me that I should do this It has been narrated in some of the tafasir. Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. When he made the dua for the destruction of his people. And of course the nation was destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. After that now of course he went and he reestablished and he's having children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. Nuh, I would like you to make a nice plate, nice cup, we may say, nice cup out of some mud. So he sits and he made that beautiful cup. Of course, the order is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the instruction is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is trying to make it as good as, it, as possible. So he makes that cup. When it's ready, Ya Allah, I'm done with it. The next revelation comes. No, now throw it on the ground and break it. Ya Allah, you asked me to work on it, work so hard on this cup to make it. And now that right after that the next order comes, throw it and break it. Ya Allah, please, can there be any change in this order? Ya Allah, what was the reason for this and what is the reason for that? And he receives the revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing him that, Oh Nuh, if you made the cup for a purpose and you did not want that cup to be destroyed, when you made a dua against that whole nation and the nation was destroyed, did you feel for them as much as you felt for a cup? Nuh, if I created human beings, I did not create them to destroy them. I did not create human beings to destroy them. I created human beings to have mercy on them. Yes, when they disobey, then finally the time comes. But oh no, we have to remember that all of those people that were destroyed is not because these, I like to punish people. What Allah is going to do by punishing you if you thank Allah, be grateful to Allah and believe in Allah. He doesn't want to punish and he does not want to torture human beings. He wants to have rahmah. He created us for his mercy. This is why the book of Allah starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim See when he's talking about the creation of the universe Rabb al-Alameen He's the Lord of the whole universe. Why did he create everything? Why is he making the whole system run? Because he is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amazing. If we were really to think about it, we would never think of using two attributes of Allah that are driven from the same root word, and that is Rahman. Rahman and Rahim both are referring to Rahman of Allah. Okay, use Rahman and then something else with it. Shadid al Iqab. His punishment is very severe. Al Muntaqim, who can take revenge or who can punish people back for doing wrong. But no. Al Rahman al Rahim. And then the ayah after that doesn't mention the other type of attributes of Allah. It's the same thing, that's it. The creation of the universe, the purpose of it is the rahmah for, for human beings. 
He created all of this to have rahmah on us, not to punish us, not to make us suffer. This is what many times comes to the mind. How come we are suffering? How come people are suffering? This is our actions. These are our deeds. And then finally, may Allah protect us. May Allah give us the right understanding. We want to order Allah on top of this. That, Ya Allah, I said I made a dua to do this. And Ya Allah, how come it's not happening? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps on accepting the dua of a person as long as malam is ta'jil. As long as he does not start getting impatient with his dua. So they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what does being impatient mean? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when a person starts thinking, how come Allah is not accepting my dua? That's it. Allah closes the door of the acceptance of his dua. But are you ordering me? Are you ordering me? And you're telling me, how come I didn't accept your dua? Subhanallah. Was that a dua or order? Dua is a request for help. And here, the dua is going like an order. Ya Allah, I told you to do this. How come it's not happening? We need to realize our situation. Who are we? What is our position? How can we say something like this? How can we even think of something like this? And the reason I mentioned this is becoming something very common. Oh, we all make dua, but nothing, nothing is happening. No, no. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for these type of thoughts. And really, they never suit us. They never suit us. In this worldly positions, you go to a person who's higher than you, and you go and request him for something, he is not done. He didn't do it. Next time you go, you will remind him again. You will request him again. But you won't tell him. I told you yesterday, how come you didn't do it yet? In this worldly positions, we don't do that. We don't go and tell the bosses at the work that yesterday I told you to do this for me. How come you didn't do it? Oh, please, you know, uh, I'm sorry to disturb you again, but uh, I just wanted to remind you. Look at our words with people like us. And hear how we are dealing with Rabbul Alameen, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did we forget our position, our limitations, our situation? And subhanallah, the azamah of Allah, the greatness of Allah. We need to keep that in mind. We are not ordering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest of all the creatures, had no power of ordering Allah. Who can order Allah? So, it's not orders to Allah. We need to understand our situation. We are human beings. We are servants. We should keep on begging him. And we should even, if we see no results, he knows how to deal with it. Even if we see no results, you beg him for you need. And we should keep on begging him. Never with the intention or with even that thought, the slightest thought that would come to mind, that I know it won't be accepted. That's it. We are closed the door for ourselves. Because now we are talking to someone who knows the situation of the heart. If you go and talk to your boss, and you tell him that, you know, please, I would like you to change my holiday schedule for me. And I know you won't do it. You tell him that. I know you won't do it, but I would like to request you to do that. Of course, as soon as you tell him that, you know him. That he doesn't want to do it for you. In the heart, when we are saying, I know you won't accept it, we told him because that is, that's not hidden from him. He knows what's hidden, and he knows even more secrets than what's hidden. What's more secret than that? He, he knows a sir. Sir is secret. What is more hidden than the secret? It's something that we will be thinking about it in the future, and we don't, about it, we don't even know about it. He knows about what we'll be thinking in the future. <coughs> he even knows that. So, we need to realize our position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realize that our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being servants and true, we need to be the true servants. Beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray for the hidayah of the people and try your best for the hidayah of the people so that people will see the deen of Allah. Before we even make a dua for punishment, let's fulfill our responsibility of telling them what this deen of Allah is what they should be doing with their lives, what they are expected to do with this life that they have been blessed with, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them for. Many people have never even thought about it in their lives. They just think that this is the direction of the life, this is I'm supposed to live, this is what they were taught from childhood, and this is what they continue doing for the rest of their lives. They have never thought about it. They never gave it a thought that this is something of importance, and there is God, and there is Deen, and there is Akhirah, and there is Hisab, and there is Jannah, and there is Jahannam. Never thought about it. We need to remind them.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and give us the right understanding of the deen. Aqulu qawlu ta'ala wa astaghfirullah wa alaykum wa lisa'ilu al-muslimina wa al-muslimat wa akhru al-awana. Alhamdulillah.